A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. To my shame, I say that we were too weak. But if anyone dares to boast of, I am speaking in foolishness. I also dare. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they children of Israel? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I am talking like an insane person. I am still more, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, far worse beatings, and numerous brushes with death. Five times at the hands of the Jews, I received 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I passed a night and a day on the deep, on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own race, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, through hunger and thirst, through frequent fastings, through cold and exposure. And apart from these things, there is the daily pressure upon me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is led to sin, and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The word of the Lord. From all their distress, God rescues the just. From all their distress, God rescues the just. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord. The lowly will hear me and be glad. From all their distress, God rescues the just. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us together extol his name. I sought the Lord. And he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. From all your stress, Look to him that you may be radiant with joy, and your faces may not blush with shame. When the poor one called out, the Lord heard, and from all his distress, he saved him. Dominus Fobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matteo, Jesus said to his disciples, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and decay destroy, and thieves break in and steal but store up treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor decay destroys, nor thieves break in and steal. 
For where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is sound, your whole body will be filled with light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be in darkness. And if the light in you is darkness, how great will the darkness be? Verbum Domini. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in his monumental, I believe it's in his monumental work, The City of God, that St. Augustine took a poll about what the ultimate purpose or happiness is in life. Most people, if you ask them what they would like to be, they would say happy, but the question isn't being happy as such, it's what makes you happy then? And he got something like 300 answers, and all of them were wrong. <laughs> uh, many of the ancient philosophers, for reason alone, tried to examine what could make us happy. Aristotle was among them, Cicero, all kinds of people in the ancient classical world. And they basically came to the conclusion that um, food and drink can't make you happy because as you know, you eat too much or you drink too much and your body rebels and throws it off. They also decided that riches are often kept to the hurt of their owner. You want to see your family divide, just leave a will. Who gets what? I wanted that mirror of Great Aunt Martha and you're getting it. And people stop speaking to each other. The body can't, therefore, material goods can't make you happy. So then they tried the soul. Well, the soul is true. It's an action of the soul, but the body serves the soul. And so the soul itself can't be the final purpose of life or happiness. It has to be something more than that. And even virtue doesn't make you happy because virtue is a preparation for something else. Power, honor, riches, well, you know, Honor and riches, they're very fleeting. Today everybody lauds you, tomorrow they condemn you. When it comes to riches, riches, all the stock market has to do is fall or there'll be a war and you lose your, your wealth. So the final conclusion was that there's nothing on earth that can make you happy. Now that's what reason concluded. Therefore, it must be something else. Our Lord addresses this issue because instead of happiness, he uses a more scriptural word, which is treasure. Where does your treasure lie? And the uh, various conclusions, as he shows, are equally, they can't lie in material goods because you could lose those very easily. Instead, the only place where you can experience the final perfection of your soul, the final completion of your life, whereas he says, moths can't destroy it and thieves can't break in and take it, wars and insurrections can't touch it, really, is in the experience of your soul in which you have grace with God on earth, which you can change by sin, but the final experience has to be heaven. And so there is a conflict set up in human life already between what's called in the scripture passage here, uh, God and mammon. In other words, materialism and the fact that matter is important to us, we don't believe it's evil, but it's a means to something else and therefore cannot be our final purpose. And the... Uh, judgment of all the goods we receive in light of this truth is something that is involved in the example our Lord uses of the sound eye. 
as the eye is good, and you can see, it leads you along, it's the lamp of the body, so the analogy is made to the mind. If in your quest for happiness you discover that it has to consist in divine truth, strangely enough, the pagan philosopher Aristotle, at the end of his own work on ethics, says, the purpose of the formation of virtue in this world is the contemplation of divine truth. That the actual experience of truth is the most important happiness to us. But if you don't experience truth, if your eye is tinted, as mine is, I don't know about yours, but my eyes are very weak now because I'm getting older and I often can't read the words on the page uh, I think it's one word and it turns out to be another word when I try reading it. In a similar way, materialism prejudices you and jaundices your experience of why you're here. And therefore, as our Lord says, if the light in you is darkness, in other words, if reason leads you to the opposite conclusion, that you should just experience a glut of matter and materialism and no spirit, how great will the darkness be? And this includes the goods that we receive. This passage, of course, is a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount, and where we've affirmed the absolute transcendence of God, now we're invited also to trust in God, who gives us both good and evil things sometimes, he allows us to experience evil, as did St. Paul, and St. Paul has this long list of things he did and suffered. In other words, his works, whether they could bring him grace or not, or he could boast of them, is something that can't be. In, in this, in a sense, we agree with the Protestants, because the original grace of justification we receive is not our responsibility, except in the sense that we're open to it. It comes from God alone because it's supernatural, because it's spiritual. And we can't give this to ourselves. We rely upon him for this. And so St. Paul, after going through all these things that he could boast of regarding his own actions, even his lineage, you know, he's a Hebrew, he's a children of Hebrew, a descendant of Abraham, minister of Christ, all these things he suffered, he's comparing himself to people who come along trying to give a different doctrine of Christ than he does. He says, I must boast, I boast in the things that show my weakness, and the only thing I boast in is the Lord. So in other words, he boasts in the fact, not that he's done these works, but that the Lord has done them in him. And this is true for each of us in our own case. We have to remember to, again, there's nothing wrong with material goods. We're not uh, manichees. We don't believe they're evil. But material goods are merely a means to an end. And we have to remember why we're here. When I was uh, uh, a, a child, again, in the Baltimore Catechism in the 50s, I think question two was, why did God make me? And if I recall, the answer was, God made me to show forth his goodness and to make me happy with him in heaven. God doesn't promise us happiness here on earth. If we Hopefully, we'll experience quite a bit of it. But he doesn't promise this to us. He promises us, however, happiness in heaven. And therefore, no man can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one or love the other or be submissive to one and not to the other. You can't be a materialist and expect to be a religious person at the same time. And if you're not a religious person, look at our society today. Once you've given up the spirit in favor of matter, that's the jaundiced eye where your eye you know, is full of darkness. And it makes us, our judgments about the world very, very faulty. So, in the Sermon on the Mount, God has promised us, first of all, that we who affirm the absolute nature of God, 
should not be afraid or anxious that he doesn't want to give us these things. God wouldn't have created the world if he wanted the world to be condemned. He allows it to sin so that he'll bring forth a greater mercy, and that mercy is Jesus Christ. Um, sometimes I talk to Catholics, and I keep saying, look, God doesn't create you to send you to hell. <laughs> he creates you to send you to heaven. That's what he wants from you. If we go to hell, it's our responsibility. You know, basically people say, well, why did God send me to hell? Well, God doesn't really send anybody to hell. He judges you worthy of hell because he knows your inner thoughts and, and life. But what is he saying? Well, I've sought materialism myself my whole life, by egotism, that's where my happiness is. And then the Lord says in the judgment, that's right. That's what you want, that's what you get. You can live with yourself for all eternity. See how happy that makes you <laughs> once you've gotten along with it. In other words, you refuse to change to convert to the goodness of the world in general or to me, so that's fine. That's what you want, that's what you get for all eternity. Instead, we need to constantly remember to trust in the Lord. No matter what we're experiencing, nobody can take heaven away from us but ourselves. And God wants us to experience that. That's why we were made. That's what our happiness is. So, what the Lord has begun in your creation, may he bring to perfection when you see his face.